For the last 50 plus years, countries' primary shows of power relied on the strength of one's material output, weapons that far exceeded the strengths or capabilities of flesh and bone exclusively. Soon after splitting the atom in 1932, it was believed by some, at least in theory, that the use of men in uniform was merely a placeholder for things to come. In recent years, however, whether it be fear of a nuclear end or our inability to create sufficient robotic replacements, conflicts like the Russo-Ukraine war have proven the old ways, albeit far from ideal, are still an essential part of national defense. To clarify, the need for actual boots on the ground isn't just a basic need, but one growing in significance, more than at any other time in recorded history. A shocking turn of events, considering what everyone was told just a few years ago. Forced drafts and invasive recruitment strategies were becoming a retired practice in many countries. This was based on the belief that such a requirement was now an archaic practice to be buried and forgotten. And yet, sources now reveal, after most EU countries abandoned conscription between 2000 and 2010, a growing number are considering a change in course. These sentiments have become very real in just a handful of months, and now the world is finally taking notice. But this has not come about without some historical precedent. The lasting post-war peace that is seen in Western Europe today, when held up to how the continent behaved prior to the Cold War, is nothing short of miraculous. Outside of short periods of tranquility, such as the decades following the Napoleonic Wars, Europe was arguably the most violent place to live on the planet. With rising aggregate influence in the form of leagues and states, the early 17th century saw a massive uptick in recruitment. Analysts are quick to point out that the discrepancy between the high aspirations of sovereigns and the brutal practice of largely mercenary soldiers gave the Thirty Years' War a nightmarish character. It's important to point out that much of this turmoil had motivations stemming from religious disagreements. The three Christian organizations, the Calvinists, the Lutherans, and the Roman Catholics, used the message of creating a unified faith to galvanize foreign support. What had started as an isolated disagreement between the Roman Catholics and the Bohemians quickly morphed into a messy assortment of alliances that forced the hand of almost all of Europe, a trend that continues in modern warfare. What makes this global conflict different from all those that preceded it, though, to the point where referencing its conclusion has become a meme among history buffs, is how it transformed geopolitics forever. Nearing the end of the war, King Louis XIII of France started backing Protestant armies against the Habsburg Empire. This single decision removed religion from the main discussion. The message was clear, the future European order would be one that sought political dominance, not religious supremacy outside of its own borders. The Thirty Years' War ended with the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648, which changed the map of Europe irrevocably. The territorial clauses all favored Sweden, France, and their allies. The resulting peace agreement recognized the full territorial sovereignty of the member states of the empire. They were empowered to contract treaties with one another and with foreign powers, provided that the emperor and the empire suffered no prejudice. By this and other changes, the princes of the empire became absolute sovereigns in their own dominions. Although the unity between church and state was stronger than ever before, it was no longer the casus belli for world dominance. Instead, mass conscription became a part of a nation's identity. With the collapse of the papal dominance over Europe, monarchs could educate and deploy their people any way they saw fit. Edicts generally did not require imperial approval, so countries now were able to build armies with little resistance. The rise of Napoleon proved that troops were more accessible than ever. Levies and slavery were now more of a last resort. With sufficient gravitas, it became clear that a single individual could summon an army rivaling ancient Rome, simply by changing legislation. As stated, amassing such a force before this point was much harder and often required clever diplomacy and funding. European conscription systems began to change in a big way by the late 18th century. If nations wished to recruit troops, it had to be, for lack of a better way of putting it, non-negotiable. Most of the men in Napoleon's Grande Armée were conscripts drawn from the poorer classes. Every able-bodied man of age in France was expected to willingly join the ranks to defend the Republic or risk losing citizenship. It's not like this was a new idea, necessarily. One only needs to look at East Asia. At the start of the Han Dynasty, male commoners were liable for conscription starting from the age of 23 until the age of 56. However, this was relatively uncommon in places like Prussia, who were used to relying on superior organization and tactical factors such as order of battle to focus superior troops against inferior ones. Given approximately equivalent forces, as was generally the case with professional armies, 
these factors showed considerable importance. That would all change when the French draft model shattered their once formidable defense strategy. The effective Napoleonic recruitment tactic would set the tone for decades, with many states requiring preemptive training for all of its younger citizens. Prussia's shift after learning from previous mistakes would lead to a stunning reunification, forming the German Empire, or the Second Reich, lasting until 1918. In 1874, Russia introduced universal conscription in the modern pattern, an innovation only made possible by the abolition of serfdom in 1861. In the decades prior to World War I, universal conscription along broadly Prussian lines became the norm for European armies and those modeled on them. By 1914, the only substantial armies still completely dependent on voluntary enlistment were those of Britain and the United States. Some countries met the issue somewhere in the middle, such as the post-Napoleonic French method of conscripting armies for domestic stability, while professional units oversaw colonial security abroad. Pre-war assembly was not only a requirement for these European nations, but it slowly became a cultural rite of passage for able-bodied males. For most of the 20th century, this form of preparation was an honor and a privilege only later to be superseded by a college degree. In some ways, this emphasis on martial bravery fueled a craving in some countries to once again change the established paradigm. A number of alliances involving European powers, the Ottoman Empire, Russia, and other parties had existed for years, but political instability in the Balkans, particularly Bosnia, Serbia, and Herzegovina, threatened to destroy these agreements. The bubble finally burst, as many already know, in Sarajevo, Bosnia. Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, was shot to death along with his wife Sophie by the Serbian nationalist Gavrilo Princip on June 28, 1914. Europe once again had to look at their draft systems in preparation for war, one unlike anything anyone had ever seen. For countries like the US and the UK, their stance on voluntary enlistment during the First World War started off strong. America had little interest in putting boots to the ground. The chief task of the nation would be provide war materials, not men, for the Allies. Most Americans believed that raising a large army would divert the United States from its essential obligation and would thus do more harm than good. As the war heated up in 1915, President Woodrow Wilson recommended an increase of the regular army from 142,000 to 400,000 men, but Congress was extremely hesitant, believing this would be an unnecessary tax burden. Almost a year later, war was declared, and the armed forces had 378,619 men ready to fight. As for the British, the conflict was already well underway. Lord Kitchener's campaign, promoted by his famous Your Country Needs You poster, had encouraged over one million men to enlist by January 1915. That said, the initial losses eclipsed voluntary recruitment, and the country had no choice but to introduce conscription. By 1916, Britain's Military Service Act imposed conscription on all single men between the ages of 18 and 41, with a second act removing the exemption for married men as well. The age limit had also been raised to 51. The full period had raised 2.5 million men, and the U.S. quickly followed suit with Congress passing the Selective Service Act, which Wilson signed into law on May 18, 1917. The act required all men in the U.S. between the ages of 21 and 30 to register for military service. Within a few months, some 10 million men across the country had registered in response to the military draft. By the end of World War I, 24 million were registered under Wilson's act. About 4.8 million ended up serving of which 2.8 million were drafted. To reiterate, the rest of Europe had adopted a completely different philosophy. With a continent full of citizen soldiers, countries like Germany didn't hesitate to use this to their advantage. In Germany, at the age of 20, men would undertake two or three years of peacetime training in the active army. At the end of their training, they were allowed to go back into civilian life, but could be called back to the army at any time up to the age of 45. This made conscription an immediate option and Germany only needed 12 days to raise their army from 800,000 to 3.5 million men, meaning that in Germany under 60% of military-aged men served. This initial speed proved to be devastating for the Allies, but Britain's naval blockade in the English Channel and the North Sea, with the assistance of Italy and France in the Atlantic, eventually choked the Germans into submission. Harsh weather conditions prevented the country from self-sustaining, and World War I officially came to an end in June 1919. In a startling turn of events, the developing West's draft policies would once again be challenged on September 1, 1939, when the Allies once again found themselves waging a war against a revivified Germany. 
Just a few years before the beginning of the Great War, Hitler, in direct defiance of the Treaty of Versailles, announced the German rearmament program in 1935. The army reached its projected goal of 36 divisions. During the autumn of 1937, two more corps were formed. In 1938, four additional corps were formed, with the inclusion of five divisions of the Austrian army after the Anschluss in March. Once again, Germany's swift conscription and deployment strategies knocked the enemy off its feet. This time, the output was far too great for the rest of Europe to handle. Belgium, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and France fell in just weeks, leaving the UK isolated on their small island across the Channel. During World War II, a total of about 13.6 million soldiers served in the German army. Army personnel were made up of volunteers and conscripts. The British needed to act quickly. There was no room for hesitation. This time, the British draft was far more aggressive. Conscientious objectors had to appear before a tribunal to argue their reasons for refusing to join up. If their cases were not dismissed, they were granted one of several categories of exemption and were given non-combatant jobs. The U.S. also changed its policies dramatically, starting the first peacetime draft in national history. They implemented a lottery system, and able-bodied men were required to serve at least one year in the armed forces. It would only intensify in the coming years, as once the U.S. entered World War II, draft terms extended through the duration of the fighting. By the end of the war in 1945, 50 million men between the ages of 18 and 45 had registered for the draft, and 10 million had been inducted into the military. Given the fact that the United States possessed a larger population, their conscription policy was a little more balanced. An example of this would be Executive Order 9279, which closed voluntary enlistment for all men between 18 to 37. However, the British National Service ended in 1960, while the U.S. military drafted 2.2 million American men out of an eligible pool of 27 million until 1973, when they were fighting a war with Vietnam. The U.S. and the Soviet Union continued to focus on conscription during the Cold War, but the rest of Europe was busy licking their wounds. As each decade passed, the continued continental peace prompted many nations to question World War-level conscription. For a while, it started to look like an unnecessary burden on the taxpayer. By the early 2000s, politicians began promoting a message of neutrality. In recent years, most participants, who chose slowly to dismantle their military programs, are now starting to rethink these policy changes. As violence escalates between Russia and Ukraine, nations are once again calling to raise the banners, in preparation for a new, growing threat from the East. The UK military leadership, specifically figures like General Patrick Sanders, the Army's Chief of the General Staff, argued that the UK should form a citizen army in the event of open conflict between NATO and Russia. This pre-recruitment address has reintroduced a topic that few have broached in over 50 years. A handful of other military leaders, such as retired Colonel Tim Collins, have since vocally supported the proposition. Initially, the push to recruit more men seems presumptuous, and yet, when one thinks about how the UK's voluntary draft system has handicapped them in the past, it's hard to deny that more troops would be helpful if confronted with another large war. The UK has responded to the recent unrest, stating it has no plans to introduce conscription. So at least for now, that option has been taken off the table. Countries like Lithuania, located in the Baltic region of Europe, have continued their efforts for recruitment with a conscription list of 27,000 men. Being much closer to the ongoing battle, it makes sense that the small nation would continue to raise their numbers, but they have announced that they currently have no interest in making this model universal. In 2004, Italy's force became a professional all-volunteer system, but this can possibly change. According to various sources, rumors of a possible reinstatement of compulsory military service have been around for a long time. Matteo Salvini has spoken about compulsory military service on several occasions, saying, I believe that a year of teaching the rules, good manners and duties would make good citizens. And as its interior minister, he says, he was studying the costs, ways and times to evaluate if, how and when to reintroduce military service for a few months for our boys and girls so that they can at least learn some education that mom and dad are not able to teach them. Unlike the last two countries we've listed, the motives for Italian conscription don't seem to revolve around a Russian threat. To some, it just seems like a way to improve domestic concerns. The issue with analyzing Italy is that it isn't known for its governmental consistency. In fact, since World War II, the governing body has changed 68 times. There's no way to know what'll come next. A bit closer to the current fighting front, according to recent reports, Romania is looking like another draft supporter. 
Figures like Angel Tilvar, the country's defense minister, have recently announced that he's interested in expanding the military. Bordering Ukraine, it makes sense that there would be a call for increased militarization. After all, if push comes to shove, they would find themselves on the front line of NATO and EU defense policy, geographically close to the war in Ukraine and reported instability in Moldova. Further aside, Romania will have a hard time recruiting due to its economic position. The current salary for a Romanian non-commissioned officer, such as a sergeant or corporal, is between 459 and 994 euros per month. Because of this, conscription is looking like a pretty attractive option. When the July 2022 Black Sea Grain Initiative between Russia, Ukraine, Turkey and the United Nations collapsed last year, Ukraine sought to reroute much of its grain shipments through the Danube River. When the Russians discovered this, they launched a series of drone strikes near the Delta. Some of these explosions reportedly occurred on Romanian soil. If things escalate, this course of action seems inevitable, not to mention relations with other neighbors are equally unstable. As violence and unrest break out in the Balkans, Serbia appears to be making moves of its own. Serbian nationalists continue to apply pressure on their government, hoping that the outcry will result in serious action. But there are those who aren't in favor of these ideas. Opposition politicians and other critics of the draft have questioned the logic of a military buildup when Serbia is almost completely surrounded by NATO member countries that have superior firepower in case of a conflict. On the face of it, that seems like a pretty logical argument, but Serbia's close ties with Russia, in conjunction with a refusal to introduce sanctions, have placed figures like popular President Aleksandr Vucic in a delicate position. He himself has publicly promoted the idea of conscription amidst these developments. Even Germany, albeit more temperate today, has considered reintroducing some old customs. Like Italy, there are those who feel the decision would have a societal benefit. Citing attacks on firefighters and police officers, Chris Pistorius, Germany's federal minister of defense, told Süddeutsche Zeitung, it appears that the people have lost the awareness that they themselves are part of the state and of society. Taking responsibility for a set period could open eyes and ears for that. However, there's also an interest in bumping up unit numbers in general. A number of political leaders are complaining about a lack of troops in the Bundeswehr, the armed forces of the Federal Republic of Germany. As Russia continues to move into the West, this proposition has become a serious possibility. In France, President Emmanuel Macron is working on bringing mandatory national service back to the country. The administration hopes that the new program will help new citizens bond with the old, eventually building a national identity that has been fading in recent years. Surprisingly, much of France has shared support for the idea. A YouGov poll in February 2018 showed that 60% of French people favored a compulsory national service of between three and six months. This might come as a shock to outsiders, considering France hasn't presented itself as an advocate for martial improvements since the Second World War. Many of the previously mentioned states are looking at the Norwegian model for guidance. Since 2015, the nation has proudly stood as the first European country to have compulsory military service for both sexes and female involvement continues to rise. In 2020 alone, 33% of people who completed the initial compulsory military service were women. However, only a small percentage goes on to seek a career with the armed forces. This might change in light of recent events, but Norway has used this tradition to help young people transition into full-on adulthood. It's a model that many on the continent admire, as it may solve the decline in voluntary service in their own respective systems. The most recent and perhaps most surprising supporter of conscription is Sweden. This is an odd change of pace, considering that the nation-state has had a relatively hard stance on neutrality since King Gustav XIV's proclamation in 1834. Nevertheless, Sweden's NATO application spurred a renewed interest in modern militarization. With growing issues such as the Russian threat, Sweden's political landscape is changing dramatically. Conscription is up 30% this year, and the armed forces budget is up by 28% giving them another $2.5 billion to use to bolster their defenses. Officials are quick to point out the country's new draft system is highly selective. Out of the nearly 100,000 Swedes who turned 18 this year, recruiters only picked 4,000 men and women to serve. As is the case with France, there's little resistance to the prospect among young adults, who seem to be in favor of having a sense of direction. In theory, there seems to be a lot of positives that come with giving a uniform to those without direction. But as much as mandatory service appears harmless on its own, as history has shown, it's also quite provocative. There are a number of issues that come up when reintroducing these recruitment mechanisms. Public unrest, economic burden, lack of veteran aid, 
and other complexities can make the decision more costly than it is beneficial. Chief amongst them, however, would probably be related to the patterns observed earlier in this video. No matter how you look at the progression, Europe has always followed the same trend, even during the time of levies and slavery, pushing one's populace into service more often than not starts a chain reaction. Take Romania and Serbia, for example. Reports state that the Romanian president's decision to push conscription followed a recent announcement by Serbia's military to do the same, where the defense minister in Belgrade has been pushing for a return of mandatory military service. If these policies are approved, which they most likely will be, the two countries will continue to double down. This move, joined with a scarcity of resources, can make the prospect of war all the more tantalizing, considering what the spoils can do for your people. Not only this, but Serbia's continual support for Russia puts them in a position many countries have held in the past, one that just might call on them to fulfill a fatal bargain. Building a formidable army not only threatens those next to you, but it also makes you a prime candidate for future involvement. National defense is something every country requires, but it puts you in the line of fire if done incorrectly. As far as predictions go, nothing can really be said beyond pure speculation. Most governments in Europe are fearful of publicly initiating compulsory service, as removing progressive policy is an incredibly difficult task. We see that countries like the UK are adamantly opposed to the idea of conscription. However, given all the available data, it doesn't look like the continent will have much of a choice if these states wish to hold on to their national identity, and that's the common theme found in every segment of the European timeline. Now check out US Congressman warns of new Russian doomsday weapon, or watch this video instead.